Good morning, everyone. Um, Celia Santi, Dr. Celia Santi and I are very excited to host uh, this mini symposium. Uh, good morning, everyone in the Americas, and good day to those elsewhere. Welcome to the opening gates, new methods and approaches for effective contraception in both sexes mini symposium sponsored by SSR, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and FER. This series has a second edition next Tuesday, but at different time. So make sure that you check the time uh, for that. <clears throat> and the idea for that was to um, uh, reach out to different folks at different times. So that's why we do it in the morning today, but in the afternoon next uh, series. I want to thank SSR and the Gates Foundation for sponsoring this event. Over the last few years, these two organizations have really uh, forge a really nice partnership to expand and highlight research in female and male contraception, especially in, in innovative approaches to contraception, which is part of the big initiative of the Gates Foundation. Now, more recently, both organizations have uh, agreed that building research capacity and training folks in, in countries with uh, less resources would be uh, a good uh, approach to expand the knowledge of contraception and, and women's health. Uh, in that vein, um, SSR approached uh, FAIR Frontiers in Reproduction uh, to assist and develop a course, a much a, a shorter version of the course that we teach, uh, to implement eventually in those places with less resources, such as in like places in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, we, Frontiers in Reproduction, runs a course of six weeks for six weeks in Woods Hall every year that broadly cover all aspects of, uh, of reproduction, both technically and conceptually, um, and has been a leading course in the world. So with that um, impetus, we decided to, uh, to join in and assist and develop this one-week course and we'll run in Buenos Aires, as you saw in the open slide, in March, from March uh, 13 to the 17th of 2023. Applications and the link uh, are available on the SSR website and the application deadline will be in December 17. So the course will be one week course, will be hands-on with lectures and um, uh, laboratories run by experts in the field. Uh, thanks to the generosity of SSR and the Gates Foundation, all the costs for the course, traveling, housing, and meals will be available. There are, uh, will be covered. There will be 12 spots available for researchers, graduate students, uh, postdocs, um, young scientists uh, in Latin American countries. So they should apply. So please, if you know some of those folks, uh, contact them and tell them to apply. The information can be accessed in the SSR website. Uh, we hope we hope that this first offering is the first one, uh, and we can expand this to to other continents, as I indicated. Uh, after that brief introduction, I want to now pass the baton to Dr. Celia Santi from the uh, Washington School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, to lead the speaker's presentation. I want to thank the speakers for participating in this mini symposium. I'm very excited to hear this uh, talk. Thank you. Celia? Yes, thank you. Um, today we have the pleasure to introduce two very exciting talks. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Jan Jun Son. Dr. Son is an associate professor at the Department of Physiology and Neurobiology at the University of Connecticut. His lab studies the ovulation mechanism in Drosophila, and today he will tell us about how the Drosophila ovulation platform can be used to screen contraceptive compounds that can effectively in inhibit follicle rupture. After that, uh, we will have our second talk. Um, our second speaker will be Dr. Philip Santangelo. And Dr. Santangelo is a professor at the Wallace uh, Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech. And he's also a professor at Emory University. His lab uh, has developed uh, methods to track mRNAs in both uh, organs and at a single molecule level in living cells. And today he's going to tell us how these methods can be used to effectively deliver contraceptives in the female genital tract. With that, I will give the uh, word to Gen Dr. Sun. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the, uh, the, this mini symposium. 
Um, thank you, Rafael and uh, Celia, to invite me to give me this opportunity to share our uh, work. So this is actually the videos showing the uh, Drosophila follicle ruptures in a, cell, uh, in a culture dish. So as we all know that uh, we have a very effective uh, um, birth control uh, method, birth control pills after 1960s. Uh, however, we are still facing uh, many challenges in the contraceptive field. So globally, there's more than 40% of pregnancies are unintended and more than 200 million women in the developing countries have unmet needs uh, for contraceptions. And most commonly, the side effects and uh, you know, health concerns are of the health contra uh, hormone contraceptives are the, often the leading cause for the non-use or discontinuations. So there's a need to develop a non-steroid-based or non-hormone-based uh, contraceptives that could alleviate these uh, society burdens. So as we all know that the birth control pills has both uh, sometimes has the you know high level of estrogen and progesterone that is going to inhibit uh, the uh, pituitary glands to release FSH and LH that ultimately block the follicle development and ovulations in order to uh, to prevent the contraceptions uh, pre prevent the uh, pregnancies. So if we can directly inhibit the ovulation directly without affecting the pituitary and the uh, uh, ovary uh, aspect. So that could be a non-steroid or non-hormone based contraceptive. And this is actually supported by the idea, by the women that with the luteinized unruptured follicle syndromes. So these women are in fertile and they don't have the follicle ruptures. Uh, they cannot release the eggs through the follicle ruptures. However, they have a normal hormone cycles. So then how can we target uh, ovulation to directly inhibit the ovulation process? So the ovulation is well understood in the mammalian systems, uh, particularly in the mice. So we know that ovulation is triggered by the LH surge, and that lead to a complex signaling events that ultimately lead to the meiosis resumption, cumulus expansions, and follicle ruptures. So meiosis resumption and cumulus expansions are well understood. In contrast, the follicle rupture is not quite uh, understood yet. So it is believed that LH and LH receptor will activate uh, both G-alpha-S and G-alpha-Q signaling pathway that ultimately lead to the activations of the prostaglandin and the progesterone signaling that will activate certain proteus at the apex region of the follicle that lead to break down the follicle wall and ultimately lead to the follicle rupture process. As an example, Tom Curry's lab uh, in long time ago showed that, that uh, gelatinous activity is detected right at the apex, right before the follicle ruptures. However, we still don't know how this gelatinous activity is precisely regulated. So if we can understand better this follicle rupture process, maybe we're able to uh, better develop the uh, contraceptive uh, method to targeting this process. And I want to mention that there's multiple labs actually utilize the mouse systems to, you know, to, uh, to develop the phenotypic screens to target either meiosis or cumulus expansions or overall ovulation process. But the the cost is pretty high and also the uh, throughput is, is not very high. So, so it will be interesting. So my lab is interesting to see what we can contribute from other perspective. Um, as we all know that ovulation is a general phenomenon and it's happening in many organisms, not only in the humans and mammals, but it's also in denipus, chickens, fish, and especially the Drosophila. So, for the Drosophila, one female can actually ovulate about 70 eggs every day. So if the ovulation mechanism is conserved, we could utilize these low organisms to try to screen the drugs that can target this ovulation process. So the real question is whether the ovulation is actually conserved and how can we uh, develop those uh, model organisms to uh, use for the screened contraceptives. So today I structured my talk into two parts. 
first I will tell you some of the, uh, you know, the, the study we performed in the Drosophila ovulation, and we found that some of the mechanics is actually pretty conserved. And second, we're going to talk about how we can utilize the Drosophila as a system to screen the contraceptive compounds. So here I show you the reproductive systems for the uh, you know, female reproductive systems in Drosophila. So there's two ovaries and connected by the oviduct and the, the uterus. And there's two types of sperm storage organs, seminal receptacle and the spermaceci. So that will be used for the store the sperms. And also the spermaceci and the pyovarians are glandular tissue. They will secrete their content into the reproductive tract and regulate the uh, fertilization process. So unlike mammals, Drosophila ovary is actually organized into called ovarian structures. So typically there's roughly about 40 to 60, 16 ovarian structures. And this is the egg assembly lines. There's a germline stem cells and follicle stem cells at the anterior tip that's going to proliferate and differentiate and give rise to the first stage one egg chambers or called follicles. And these follicle will go through 14 different stages to reach the maturity. So in the mature follicles, there's one oocyte wrapped by a layer of somatic follicle cells. So luckily we actually did a, a screens and we identified the genetic tools like the Tiscal 4 driver. They can label these mature follicle cells specifically. So we use the Gulf 4 US system in the Drosophila. And previous work have been shown that ovulation in Drosophila is actually induced by the matings and particularly for, uh, you know, through the seminal uh, food proteins. And it's been believed that the mating activate octopaminergic systems. So the octopamine neurons innervating the reproductive tract and the ovarian, and ovarian muscles. And those octopamine will regulate the muscle contractions that somehow lead to the contraction and squeeze the egg into the oviduct. So a real question is whether the Drosophila ovulation also have a follicle rupture-like process, like they break down the follicle cell wall and lead the oocyte into the oviduct, or the entire follicle just getting to the oviduct. To address this question, we utilize this genetic tools to trace the, the fate of these follicle cells. What we found that after ovulations, so these cells are still remaining at the end, end of the ovarians. So you can see in this case, there's no oocyte inside, they are all collapsed, but the cells are still remaining. And these cells actually we found they turn into yellowish colors. So we named these uh, uh, Drosophila copsludiums. So then the real question is how the impact follicles to be able to release the egg inside. So we actually turn into the mammarian ovulation mechanics because the you know, gelatinous activities activated at the apex and that could break down the follicle wall. So we hypothesize maybe that gelatinous activity is also involved in the Drosophila ovulation to break down the follicle wall. To test that idea, we use exactly the, the same uh, assays to label the gelatinous activity in the entire uh, follicles. So this is work actually done by former graduate student, uh, Laila Dedi. And you can see that in the entire ovary, there's only one distinct uh, follicles that has the gelatinous activity in the posterior regions and where the egg is going to release into the oviduct. So in Drosophila, there's only two gelatinous. One is MMP1 and the other one is MMP2. And we found that only MMP2 is very specifically expressed in the posterior region of the mature follicles and only in the mature follicles, not in the younger follicles. While the anteriors, we do see some MMP activity, uh, MMP2 expressions, and this is throughout the uh, later oogenesis. And later on, we demonstrate that MMP2 is important to, uh, to break down the posterior follicle walls. So here I show you, in the wild type, when you dissect ovary out, you can see the egg is actually in the process of ovulation. So these are the somatic follicle cells. These are the oviduct cells. So the egg is 
partly into the oviduct in the process of ovulation. However, in when we knocking down the MMP2, use the ion interference, you can see that there's no egg has the posterior broken. And we further show that that in vivo MMP2 is knocking down MMP2 is lead to the significant reduction of egg laying and the ovulation, uh, increased ovulation time. So then the next question is, what is the signal to activate MMP2? So the crew is actually come from this Gulf 4 drivers we identified. So this Gulf 4 driver 4704 is actually utilized the enhancer from the OAMB genes that drive the Gulf 4 expressions. So this Gulf 4 is expressing the mature follicle cells, which indicating that maybe the OAMB is also expressing those follicle cells. And the OAMB is an androgenic, uh, alpha androgenic receptor, and it's the receptor for the octopomy. And we know that OA is important for the ovulations. So that leads us to hypothesize, maybe OA activate the OAMB in those follicle cells, and that leads to the MMP2 activity uh, activations, and that leads to the follicle ruptures. To test this hypothesis, we actually developed this, we call the ex vivo follicle rupture assays. So we first and label those mature follicle cells, and we isolate the follicles, intact follicles, with the, you know, the intact follicle cell layers, and then we put them into the culture dish. So we either supplement with control mediums or we supplement with the octopamines to see whether they can induce rupture. Three hours later, we found that more than 80% of the follicle can actually rupture. So here I'm showing you a video recording to see the entire rupture process. So these are the 20 minutes after adding OAs. And you can pay attention to just one egg chamber that marked with the, uh, the star. This is going to rupture during the video recordings. So what you can see is posterior signal, follicle cell signal is start to diminish, diminish. And then the rest of the follicle cells are squeezing toward the anterior. So the egg is going to get into the, you know, this is in vitro. If it's in vivo, this is going to get into the oviduct and these will be remain in the, uh, in, the uh, in the in the ovaries. And we also knocking down the OAMB in the follicle cells and they didn't do anything. So which means that OA did activate OAMB in those follicle cells to activate MMP2 and lead to the follicle ruptures. So here I want to bring everybody to the same page to use this cartoon to illustrate what we learned, uh, the, the basic ovulation process. So we found that MMP2 is expressed in those posterior follicle cells. And the OAMB receptor is also expressed. And there's octopaminergic neuron that release OA that activate the receptor lead to the calcium influx and that activate MMP2. So then will the posterior follicle cell will start to trim or break down and the rest of the, the ovary will, the oocyte will release into the oviduct and the rest of the cells will remain in the uh, ovariums. So we call those uh, obstudium cells. So, there's many questions remaining after this, like how does calcium actually induce rupture? And what is the force to lead to the follicle rupture? And what is the function of corpse luteums? So many of those questions, we, we start to trying to address those questions. I just want to show you an example, what I mean, what I mean, how does calcium induce ruptures? So we actually used uh, genetic coded um, calcium uh, sensors like the GCAM to illustrate what is the calcium response looks like. So this is after adding OA, before adding OA, and then you can see when we added OA, you can see dramatic increase of the calcium, uh, cytoplasmic calcium in the entire follicle cell layers. So we kind of illustrated that in the posteriors, the calcium will lead to the MMP2 activations, but we still don't know the mechanism um, for this process. But also we don't know what is the rest of the follicle cells, why they need the calcium, what those calcium are doing in those cells. To address these questions, 
we start to using the unbiased approaches to uh, utilize the ion based screens. So the basic idea is that we use the follicle cell, mature follicle cell specific GOP4 drivers to overexpress double strand RNA to knocking down the individual genes in those follicles. And then we're trying to go through the ex vivo follicle ruptures and see which of the genes when knock it down, they will lead to the rupture defect. And we identify the multiple targets through these screens. So here I'm just going to show you two short stories. One is talking about uh, storage signaling involved in the ruptures. And the second is talking about ROS uh, involved in the follicle ruptures. So we're looking for that when you're knocking down the RNA, you have a huge inhibition of the follicle ruptures. So the first gene we identified is actually a monooxygenous called um, shade. And you can see when you, in the controls, you see the, uh, you know, the more than 60% of follicle actually ruptures. However, when you knocking down the shade in those follicle cells, they have very limited, uh, limited follicles, significant uh, lower uh, rupture rate. And we look at the shade expression, use the antibody, and the shade is not quite expressed or very weakly expressed in the younger follicle, in the stage 13 follicles, but it's dramatically increased in the stage 14. So that consistent with the idea that if you're knocking the, the shade that lead to the follicle rupture defect. We also show the in vivo that knocking down shade lead to the ovulation defect and the egg laying defect. And this is work done by former uh, graduate student, Elizabeth Knapp. So then what is shade? Shade is actually the last enzymes to convert the actaisins into the 20 hydroxyl actaisins. So in Drosophila, there's no, um, these two are the only steroid hormones. We don't have estrogen or progesterone like uh, steroids. So in some of the work, people already show that 20 hydroxyl actaisin or actaisins are functionally like a uh, uh, female-like sex hormones to regulate uh, metabolism and reproductions. So we, we wondered whether the shade is really converting E to the 20E to mediate the follicle ruptures. To test these ideas, we use either E or 20E to rescue the, the shade uh, knocking down uh, follicles. So you can see here, when you're knocking down the shade, you have a significant reduction of follicle ruptures. When you supplement it with e, uh, the actaisins, you see no rescue or maybe even worse the rupture rate. However, when you supplement the 20E, you see the dramatic increase of the, the rupture rate. So this rescue effect led us to conclude that shade converts E to 20E to regulate follicle ruptures. So then the next we want to ask whether this signaling pathway is regulating the MMP2 activities. So we use the similar genotin as assays. So in this case, we are using the isolate, uh, treated with isolated follicles. And we treated with OA, you can clearly see the dramatic increase, the number of the, you know, the, the MMP activities in the posterior follicles. There's more than 80% of the follicle has the gelatinous activity at their posterior end. However, when you're knocking down the shade, you see dramatic reduction of the, the, the percent of follicles has the MMP activity. However, when you supplement with 20E, you see significant uh, rescue effect. So these lead us to conclude that steroid signaling is required uh, for the OA-induced MMP2 activations. So next, Lizzie is asking, what is the receptor for the 20Es to regulate follicle ruptures? So in Drosophila, 20E or E can bind to the actaisin receptor called the ECR, which will heterodimerize with the USP or ultraspherical, then bind to the ECR uh, response element to regulate gene expression. So there's three different isoforms of the ECR, ECRA, ECRB1, and ECRB2. We wondered whether ECR is involved, and if so, what, which isoform is involved in this process? To address these questions, we first using the ECR dominant negative alleles, we overexpress this ECR dominant negative form 
which will block the ECR functions. And what we see is that the follicle rupture is significantly reduced. And then we overexpress each of the isoform in the ECR dominant negative at the same time with ECR dominant negative. And what we can see that ECR A, ECR B1 showed minimum rescue effect, while ECR B2 is showed the dramatic rescue effect. So this leads us to, uh, to think that ECR B2 is actually the isoform to be activated in the mature follicles. And this is actually consistent with our antibody staining as well. So here I summarize what we found. So the, the shade is upregulated in the mature follicle that lead to converting the E to the 20E and that will bind to the ECRB2 and ultraspherical to activate genes expressions. And those genes will somehow control the MMP2 activity. We still don't know what is the target to regulate the MMP2 activities. And I want to point that this signaling pathway is only activated in the very, very late mature follicle that before the ovulations. And this is very parallel to the progesterone signaling that is also important for the ovulation mammals. So next, the, we found another gene called NOx. And we also show that if you knock down the NOx in those mature follicles, you lead to the huge reduction of the uh, OA-induced follicle ruptures. And this work is uh, carried out by my former poster, Wei Li. So what you can see that we also found NOx is upregulated in the mature follicle cells, not in the younger follicles. So that is all consistent. So then what is NOx? NOx is an NADPH oxidase, and that can convert oxygen into the superoxide. So then we wondered whether superoxide is actually produced in the mature follicles after OA stimulations. So we use two different methods to detect that. First, we use the fluorescent dye called the dihydroacidium or DHE. So when it activates or binded by the superoxide, it's going to fluorescent. So you can see that in the immature follicles or the stage 13 follicles, no matter you add OA or not adding OA, there's very minimum fluorescence uh, activities or signals. So however, when we look at the mature follicles, when without OA, you see very, uh, you know, uh, very weak uh, fluorescent signals. But when you add OA, you see dramatic increase of the fluorescent intensity. And if you're knocking down the NOx in those follicles, they dampen the signals. So this leads us to think that OA maybe activate NOx to produce the superoxide. To further confirm these ideas, we use a, a different dye called the luminescent dye, the AL-012 probe. So this will be activated by the superoxide and will in, eliminate uh, uh, luminescent light. Use the plate reader, we can detect those, uh, the light. So consistent with the idea, when we adding OAs in the wild type follicles, you see the huge increase of the uh, luminescent signals. But when you get rid of the OA and B, and you have very dampened signals. And the same is true for the NOx knocking down follicles. You can see that wild type, you see the dramatic increase. But when you're knocking down NOx in those follicle cells, you have very dramatic uh, reduction of the signals. And most importantly, we found that if you get rid of the calciums using the beta AM, it can also block the OA induced, um, you know, the superoxide productions. So this leads us to conclude OA activated OAMB activated calcium in the main body follicles, the rest, you know, many of those follicle cells that lead to activation of superoxide and lead to the superoxide production. So that address one of the questions, what is the function of the rest of the, uh, the calcium in the rest of the follicle cells? That is to activate the NOx. So next we know that superoxide can be converted into hydrogen peroxide by superoxide dismutase. And so H2O2 will be categorized by the catalyst into the water and oxygen. So the question is whether superoxide is the signaling molecular for the follicle rupture 
or whether hydrogen peroxide is the signaling molecule. To address these questions, we utilize the, you know, trying to overexpress the SOD, each individual SODs to see whether we can further reduce the superoxide in the NOx RNAi background. So what we see is that SOD3 combined with NOx RNAi can further reduce the superoxide uh, productions. And SOD1 and SOD2 do not affect uh, the superoxide. And we know that SOD3 is an extracellular SOD, so which is indicating that the superoxide is actually produced extracellular. So then if superoxide is the signaling molecule, so the combination of NOx and the SOD should, should further uh, enhance the phenotype, the, the rupture defect. However, what we see is that overexpressed SOD3 are actually rescue the follicle rupture defect. So this leads us to believe that the signaling marker is not superoxide, but rather H2O2. Consistent with this idea, if you get rid of SOD3s, you should also see the defect of the follicle ruptures. And that's indeed the case. So when we knocking down the SOD3 directly in those mature follicles, you can see the dramatic reductions of the follicle ruptures. And this can be rescued by the overexpress of SOD3. And furthermore, if we overexpress catalysts, you should reduce H2 as well. That should also lead to the foreign rupture defect. That is exactly the case. When you overexpress catalysts in those mature follicles, it also leads to the foreign ruptures. So all these data support that the, the hydrogen peroxide is the signaling marker for the foreign ruptures. So here I summarize this part of the work that OA activated OA and B in the main body follicle cells that lead to calciums, lead to NOx activation and superoxide production and further convert to the H2O2 and lead to the follicle ruptures. We still don't know what is the target of H2O2 in this rupture process. I want to point out, this is actually being, uh, you know, this reactive oxygen species are important for the ovulation in, in mammal as well. And that's being illustrated by uh, Dr. Dekels, um, you know, in 2011. And they also show that H2O2 is important for the mouse ovulations. So this leads us to think maybe this process is also conserved in the mammals. So in the mammal, we still don't know where the H2O2 is come from. And we know that NOx is expressed in those uh, granulosa cells. So this may be working in the, in the mammalian system as well. So here I summarize what we learned uh, from the Drosophila ovulations. And we found that OA, the octopamine, that activate the alpha adrenergic receptor, OAMB, lead to the calcium influx in the posterior follicle cell that lead to the activation of MMP2 to break down the follicle wall. And we also show that steroid hormone, actaisin, 20 hydroxyadaisin, is important to regulate these activities. And we further show that OA, OAMB receptor in the rest of the follicle cells activate calciums, also activate the NOx to lead to the RAS productions for the follicle ruptures. So then we show the sum of the conservation. So how can we use these systems to actually to screen the contraceptives or whether we can use this system for the contraceptive screens? So I want to illustrate that there's multiple parallel signals between the mammarian and the Drosophila ovulations. I mentioned to you that matrix and metaproteus are somewhat both involved in the, in the, in the Drosophila and the mammarian ovulations. I also showed the steroid signaling is important and the RS is important. For the androgenic signaling, it's clearly is important for the ovulation in Drosophila and early work in the mammalian system is also show that it's important for the ovulation as well. And I didn't get the chance to talk to you about uh, NR5A family nucleus receptors. So our work and the Bruce Murphy's work showed that both families uh, members are actually involved in the ovulation process and they are looks like it's pretty conserved. And there's some work from our uh, work showing that downstream target of the RASMAP kinase 
components are involved in the Drosophila ovulations, and it's not known whether it's involved in the mammalian ovulations. And considering that RASMAP kinase is involved in the mammalian ovulation, we think that maybe this is also involved. And some of our later work also suggesting that uh, tocox is also involved in the fry ovulations. So with all these similarities, we think maybe we can utilize our ex vivo follicle ruptures to just screen the drugs that see whether they can inhibit the follicle rupture. And if the drug inhibiting the conserved components that could be effective to inhibit the mammarian follicle rupture as well. To test this idea, we screened, we use these assays to screen about 1,000 uh, FDA approved uh, drugs uh, from uh, uh, small libraries. And we identified that six of the drugs are very effectively to inhibit the follicle rupture process in Drosophila. It's the OA induced follicle ruptures. So this work is by, done by the technician uh, Ki Wa Zheng. So, so then the next question is whether any of these drugs can inhibit mammary ovulations. To test these ideas, we choose four of the drugs, eclosamide, phenobenzamine, chloropromazine, and amitriptylines to test in the mammary system. Through the collaboration with Teresa Woodruff labs and later on the Saul Schultz lab at the University of uh, Rutgers. So we're trying to use their in vitro follicle maturation and the ovulation assays. So this work is done by graduate student uh, Ji Yang Zhang. So in simple, the secondary follicle will be isolated from the immature uh, mice, CD1 mice, and will be captured in the alginate beads and cultured in vitro for seven days to reach the maturity. And then we'll stimulate with HCG to induce the ovulations. And the rest of the follicles, we can further culture uh, to test the P4 production as well. So use these assays, we treat the mature follicles with the drugs at this point to see whether they can inhibit this rupture process. So here I showed you that we use the endomethacin as the positive controls because we know that endomethacin is going to, is the COX inhibitor and the COX is important for the follicle rupture. Through these assays, we see about 50% reduction of the follicle rupture process by treating with endomethacin. Most importantly, three of, the three of the four drugs we tested are actually able to inhibit this follicle rupture process. So that leads us very exciting. So then the, the review asks, this is the in vivo, in vitro rupture process. How can you show that these can inhibit in vivo follicle ruptures? So that leads us to, to test the in vivo, whether any of these drugs can inhibit ovulations. So we select one of the drugs, chloropromazine, based on the following reasons. So first, there's a work showing that chloropromazine treatment can inhibit follicle ruptures, and that is believed to regulate, inhibit the hypothalamus pituitary ax access and the LH surge. And second, we found that chloropromazine can inhibit adrenergic receptors in mammals. And we also found that chloropromazine is actually inhibit OAMB to inhibit follicle ruptures. So based on the work here. So from our work, we show that calcium is important for the follicle ruptures. So if we bring the calcium in, use the ionomycin, it can efficiently induce follicle rupture. However, the chloropromazine cannot inhibit ionomycin induced follicle rupture. See, there's no difference between the control and the drug treated group. So which means chlorpromazine is act upstream of calcium. Consistent with this, this ideas, we also found that chlorpromazine treatment is going to inhibit the calcium influx. You see there's a, about 50% reduction of the calcium influx. So next, we found another agonist, dexmedetomidine. So this is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist in mammals or in the humans. And this dexmedetomidine is actually highly potent 
to regulate, induce the drosophila follicle rupture. And it's 100 fold potent than the OA itself. So we tested whether chromopromosine can inhibit dexmedetodine induced follicle rupture. So what you can see is that when we treat it with chromopromosine, it cannot inhibit dexmedetodine induced follicle rupture. So which suggests that chromopromosine is act upstream or at the OAMB. So most likely chromopromosine is a less affinities compared to the dexmedetodine. So that's why they cannot inhibit OAMB in this process. So with these two reasons, we, we're trying to test the chromopromising in vivos. And we want to bypass this problem that maybe chromopromising is going to inhibit LH surge. So that's why we utilize the super ovulation assays. So in this way, we can bypass the LH surge problems. So here, this work is done by a former uh, graduate student from uh, source lab uh, in Zen one So what he did is he injected PMSG in, um, into the immature mice, 21 days old, and wait for 45 hours. And then we inject the chromoposing or the PBS controls. And one hour later, we injected HCG to induce uh, superovulation. And after 16 hours, the oviduct will be dissected and the, mature, uh, the ovulated oocyte will be counted. The ovary will be also sectioned for examining the morphologies. And what we found is that five milligram of per kilogram of the chromosome treatment is able to significantly inhibit the number of ovulated oocytes. So furthermore, we found that there's multiple follicles or mature follicles that has entrapped oocyte, they cannot rupture, release the, the oocyte. So all these suggest that chromoposing treatment is able to inhibit superovulation in vivo. So based on these data, we think that the Drosophila follicle rupture could be a very useful assay to screen the, uh, the contraceptive compound. However, the throughput is not very high because we needed to isolate the mature follicle from the ovaries. Although we can find, we can identify about 600 to 900 follicles uh, each person, but we, we used more than 30 follicles to do the test. So that's why we only can test about 10 to 20 drugs a day. So we're thinking about how we're going to increase the throughput. And based on the work, we show that the superoxide is important for the follicle rupture as well. So we're thinking about maybe we can use the primary screens to detect the superoxide, and then we use the follicle rupture to validate. In this case, we can actually significantly increase the, the throughput. We can, one person can do four to five 96 world plates per day. <clears throat> so the question is, can we use, so based on the, you know, superoxide detection, we use the mature follicles to detect the superoxide. So the question is, can we just directly use the ovaries instead of using the mature follicles? So that will uh, further enhance our abilities to do the screens. To test this, whether OA induced the superoxide production in the ovaries. So we directly put the ovary into the, uh, 90, uh, 96 well plate reader, and we add the luminescent dyes. And you can clearly see that the OA can induce superoxide productions in the entire ovaries. So next we ask whether these superoxides all come from the mature follicles or maybe come from the rest of the follicle as well. To test that, we feed the fries at different time point with the wet yeast. So in this way, we can control how much mature follicles in their ovaries. So you can see that 24 hours feedings, there's almost no mature follicles. 48 hours feedings, you can see majority of them are mature follicles. So then we tested how much superoxide they can produce. You can see only 48 hour feedings are showing dramatic superoxide productions the younger for uh, shorter time feedings are showing less. So which means that majority of the superoxide is come from the mature follicle. So that's great. And furthermore, we show that if you mutate the OAMB, 
you also prevent the superoxide production. So this is all consistent with the idea that um, uh, the, all the superoxide produced in the ovaries come from the mature follicles. And furthermore, we show that the, the FDA drugs we identified, amitriptyline and chromophorin, they can all efficiently to inhibit uh, superoxide productions, even with the ovaries. So that lead us to develop this uh, two-step uh, screen process. So we're using the primary screens called the luminescent-based superoxide detections. We can use the uh, plate reader to, to do that. And we did, uh, we first used the singular to do the screens and we used the triple K to do the validations. And we set our uh, criteria, uh, hit criteria is the fold change is more than 0.4, <clears throat> uh, less than 0.4. And then we, the hits will go into the secondary screens and we also use the single lit uh, screens, just one wells, and then we triplicate to validate. And then furthermore, we get the dry compound to retest those and make sure that the hits are really the compound uh, indicated. So here's the example of how we go in through the uh, screens. So this is actually a reframe collection from the caliber. We screen about uh, 13 uh, thousand compound going through this. And finally, we get 29 hits uh, through this process. So in summary, we actually screened the four different libraries, uh, epigenetic libraries, diverse library from NCI and diverse library from the Cambridge and the reframe libraries from the caliber. So total, we screened about more than 20, about 20 thousand compounds through these two assays. And finally, we are getting uh, more than, more than 40, 40 hits that it can significantly inhibit OA induced follicle ruptures. So we have performing the dose response for all these compounds, and we try and uh, finish the, uh, we're trying to uh, understand the mechanisms of their actions, how they inhibit follicle rupture. So we're also in the process of the uh, mouse follicle rupture assays to validate whether any of those compounds inhibit uh, mammalian uh, follicle ruptures and eventually we'll do the in vivo testing. So here I'm going to show you some of the uh, data. So this is actually the 29 hits from the reframe libraries and we did all the dose response analysis and some of the hits are actually very uh, potent. You see that this one, it's even at the 0.1 micromole concentration, they are very effective to inhibit uh, OA induced follicle ruptures. So in order to, so we have, you know, 40 ish hits. So in order to better manage these hits, we are also trying to see whether we can identify the mechanics or maybe cluster them into groups so we can study at the same time. So we're utilizing the same assays we developed to trying to cluster them just like for the cluster one, if they are being able, if they cannot inhibit dexmedetodine induced rupture, so they are belong to the cluster one. And for the cluster two, they can rescue the, by the ionomycin induced ruptures, but they are also affecting the calciums. Like for example, the cluster three, they do not affect the OA induced calciums and they cannot be rescued by the ionomycin or they cannot inhibit ionomycin-induced ruptures. And we also find a cluster that they can inhibit both parts. They can affect the calciums, but they also cannot be rescued by the ionomycin. So using these assays, we cluster those into, uh, actually we cluster those into three to uh, four to five uh, groups uh, from the 39 hits from the diversed and reframe. We had 10 hits from the diversed and the 29 from the reframe. So they are pretty much evenly distributed in the different uh, sets, except the cluster four has a little bit more. Cluster five is that they are not following those rules. So in one of the case, they can, in, they can be rescued by the ionomycin, but they are not affecting calcium. So we're still trying to understand you know, how they actually inhibit the follicle rupture process. And for the reframe, many of the hits actually has the known target and it's not surprising. So the GPCR and the protein kinase are the most popular, uh, you know, targets being hit by the, uh, you know, target by these uh, chemicals. 
We also find the, the hits targeting the calcium channels, COX, and the chemokine receptors, reverse transcriptors, antioxidant, and others we don't know. So we also collaborated with source lab and trying to validate these hits use the in vitro assay as well. And this work is done by Ji Yang and uh, uh, Pavana uh, poster from the source lab. So we tested the 10 of the hits from the diverse set. You can see three of the hits are showing significant inhibition of the follicle rupture process. And we also tested the 10 of the hits. We randomly selected 10 hits from the reframes and we found that four of the hits are showing the uh, inhibitions. So we are still in the process of testing the remaining 19 hits from the reframe as well. So these are actually make us very exciting that, you know, the, the, the compound that can inhibit the follicle rupture in flies can also inhibit follicle rupture in mouse. So in the future, we are, uh, we are also trying to do the in vivo validations and one of the acids we're using is the superoxide, uh, uh, superovulation acids. And we're also interested in to test the fertility using the fertility test. And eventually we're interested to identify the target um, because the, the, the known target doesn't mean is the real target that involving the follicle ruptures. So we want to use the biased, unbiased acids to identify those targets. So, I hope I convinced you that Drosophila utilize some of the conserved molecular mechanisms for follicle ruptures. And I also showed you that ex vivo follicle rupture is a powerful acid for genetic and pharmacological screens. And we developed a novel platform for screen contraceptive compound using the Drosophila ovulation acids. With that, I would like to thank the people who did the work. And this is my current lab. And I want to mention that In Chung is also a graduate student help a lot uh, with Yu Ping's to actually perform the, the, the entire screen process. And these are the uh, former lab members. And I also want to thank the uh, undergraduate student who actually participate in the uh, screen process. I would like to acknowledge the collaborators and Teresa Woodroff is a huge um, you know, support for this project and trying to validate in Mambo and later on So Shao and his um, people uh, in his lab. I would like to thank Bruce Murphy's for his uh, consultations and knowledge. Kyle, uh, Anaba, Ashley, and the NCI is probably the compound for the screens. And I also like to thank Steve Wood from the Gates Foundation and Dan Johnston from the NIH uh, for their helpful discussions. And here's funding uh, to support this work. Um, thank you very much. I would like to take any questions if you have. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sun. Uh, we are open for questions now. So I see one here, one question is, the, do all these uh, Drosophila protein targets have human equivalence? So the so maybe if I understand the question correctly, you're asking about the genes, whether the, the genes have the human homologue. Yes, all the genes we talk about are actually has human homologue. Like NOx, they have five uh, NOx in the mammals, in humans, NOx1 to NOx5. But in typically in the mammal, in the Drosophila, there's only one for the same family. Like we only have one NOx in Drosophila. There's five NOx in the in the mammalian systems. And like the gelatinous MMP is the same. We have two MMPs, one is membrane tethered, one is the uh, secreted. Like in mouse, there's 24 MMPs. So it's more complex in the, in the mammals. I hope I address the questions. Okay, do we have any more questions? I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. Um, there's one just popped up, Celia. Okay, very nice talk. I wanted to know if inhibiting the follicle rupture will be preferable to inhibiting the follicle maturation for any reason. That's a very good question. Um, so follicle rupture, if you inhibit the follicle ruptures, so that's the last step to release the, the oocyte. 
So it's not going to influence the hormone productions like in the case of the humans, right? If you influence the follicle maturation, you will affect the estrogen production, you will affect progesterone productions. But if you only inhibit the follicle rupture, the luteinization step is fine. You can still producing those all hormones, just like in the luteinized unruptured follicle syndromes, right? Those women uh, has normal hormone cycles. So the only problem they cannot conceive. So then they go to the clinic and they trying to test why they become infertile. And then the doctor trying to run the hormone panel, that's the first pass, and they are all normal. And then later on, the doctor trying to, you know, doing the consecutive ultrasounds to trying to see whether the follicle actually rupture, and they found that they are not rupture. So that's why I think inhibiting rupture is the best ways to, to generate non-hormone based uh, steroid. And it's also not going to affect your in uh, endogenous hormone levels. Okay, we have another question. Great talk, Chen Shun. Uh, I noticed that some genes you showed in the, um, are highly upregulated when uh, fly follicles reach the full maturation. How about the transcript transcriptional changes during the short-term ovulation process? In mammalian species, many essential genes are highly induced by the LH during ovulation, only such as a a reg COX-2 and progesterone receptor? Um, so actually, the, we are utilized the phenotypic screens. Um, so we actually don't know whether the hit is going to hit the COX or hit the, you know, the NOX. Um, so I think any components that is going to import, that is important for the follicle rupture will actually come out of, uh, from our, uh, you know, will be identified um, from our screens. So we're not specifically target the only upregulated genes in this process. Celia, there is a great uh, question in the chat. Um, great talk, Dr. Sun. Could inhibiting follicle rupture lead to ovarian cyst in humans? That's a very good question. So, I think it's probably not. Um, so in the luteinized unruptured follicle syndromes, these women do not have multiple cyst formations because once the follicle luteinized, I think even they don't rupture, they will still degenerate it, you know, after a certain period. So that's initiate the next cycles. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to affect in the, you know, generating more cysts. This is unlike the PCOS because PCOS is actually affecting the follicle maturation step. So that's why they cannot luteinize, they cannot actually go in through the degradation process. We have more questions in the chat. Uh, how do you administer the inhibitors targeting specifically the ovary? That's a very good question. So this, the, the screens we are performing is really a very, very early steps. We're trying to you know, identify the compound and trying to see whether they can inhibit. I think there's a lot of work needed to be done to, in the future to modify the compound or even to you know, develop a new you know, delivery assays like Phil is going to talk about you know, the new delivery assays. I think it's a multi, you know, uh, approaches. So we are not, I don't think we have the, um, we have a clear answer for this question, how we're going to deliver. But if we can identify a compound that is very targeting a very specific component in the follicle rupture, maybe you can just use the auto delivery systems. Thank you. There's another question here. Have you explored how anti mullerian hormone inhibits follicle development. Is there any insect equivalent? Ah, that's a very interesting question. Um, so at least based on the BLAST search, the, we don't have the AMH-like uh, molecules in the fries, but that doesn't mean there's no equivalent, you know, factors that's regulating the, you know, the follicle development in the younger stages. So that will need more, you know, functional assays to trying to test it. Um, but I want to say that many of the, you know, the many of the the components secrete the peptide. You couldn't find the 
uh, conserved uh, genes to encoding that, but actually has the equivalent uh, molecular functions. Like for example, the glucagons, there's no glucagons being coded in the fries, but there's a glucagon-like molecule like the AMPK that is actually functionally equivalent to the glucagon to regulate the metabolism. So I think we cannot just based on the blood search to say there's no uh, conserved components. Thank you. One more, one more question, Celia. Yeah, an excellent talk. As you, as you just said, mammals are much more complex in terms of metalloproteinases. Extracellular matrix is quite different in mammals comparing to flies. What are your thoughts about this? Ah, it's very nice questions. So yes, it's we cannot use the flies to replace mammals. There's no ways for this process. Um, you know, the mammalian system is much more complex. And, but what we are thinking is that maybe we can use the fries to identify those conserved components and maybe even identify the targets. So then we can study those targets in the mammalian systems and see whether they are involving the uh, ovulation or follicle rupture or whether they cause the infertilities. So then you can target the specific isoforms in those genes and trying to develop more specific uh, uh, contraceptive compounds. So I'm not saying that the one we develop will be right getting into the, uh, into the memory or into the human systems. Yeah. It's more generating a two compound so that we can study it. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Son, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So we are now continue with Dr. Santangelo. Great, um, I'll get started. So today I'm gonna to talk about something, uh, an approach that's actually quite different than uh, I think most of you are familiar with. And uh, I would say we're still uh, at the beginnings of this work in many respects, but at the same time, I think we've made some good progress. So I work, my lab works on mRNA encoded uh, proteins uh, for therapeutics in general, but uh, we've worked on mRNA encoded antibodies actually for, for quite a while. And so this work really came out of some work that we were doing on the lung. And so it goes back to a paper that was published in 2018 in Nature Communications, where we showed that you could literally spray mRNA in water uh, at, on the respiratory epithelium and actually get it to express antibodies. And we thought, well, that's really interesting, um, almost kind of crazy, to be honest. <laughs> at first we thought, I can't believe this actually works. Uh, it's not incredibly efficient, but at the same time it was reasonable. Um, and there are a lot of positives to the approach in general, but my, my point was just that we realized that um, very simple formula, and we were using a very simple formulation, which I'll get to uh, during this talk, but essentially it was, very, it was fairly straightforward to get um, a muco the mucosal epithelium to actually express an antibody. So after doing this in the lung, we thought, hey, what about um, both uh, the rectal epithelium and the vaginal epithelium, both vaginal and cervical? And so we, we actually started doing some work on, on the cervical and, and vaginal epithelium and lo and behold found that they were also permissive to mRNA delivery, which I'm going to talk about today, and the expression of antibodies. But I wanted to give some context to that, because I think at first, when people look at this idea, they think I'm crazy most of the time. <laughs> and that, so I thought, you know, how in the world could this work? But it does. And I think there's, there's a, a lot of potential for it in the future. And I'm going to specifically talk about the delivery of mRNA that encode for antibodies against sperm. And so uh, we don't do this work in a vacuum. And so I want to acknowledge some of the other folks that are involved in this work. So I'm Phil Santangelo from Emory and Georgia Tech, BME. Uh, Deborah Anderson uh, has been a great collaborator at Boston University. Francois Villinger at the University, University of Louisiana at Lafayette at the New Iberia Research Center. So we do monkey work with Francois and Kevin Whaley at Zapbio. Uh, they have been working on this particular antibody with Deborah, I think, for some time. Um, so what are we trying to do? Or maybe a better question is, um, you know, what's the goal here? And so we're really trying to develop a self-applied, non-hormonal-based contraceptive technology that uses reversible immunocontraception. Um, and so you might, and there are, uh, Deborah, I know, and others are working on other ways to deliver 
uh, those antibodies. These are antibodies against sperm, which we'll talk about in a second against CD52G. But we thought there might be another way. And so the other way in particular, and I would say one of the big challenges with immunocontraception is delivery. And so delivery, potency, durability, control, um, there's certainly two applications that I think are important. One is an on-demand application, so short-term um, immunocontraception, and then a longer-acting um, approach, which is a longer-term goal for us. But here we were basically going to talk about using synthetic mRNA, uh, very much like the ones that are in the vaccines, but not making a vaccine, I should mention. <laughs> but we're using these mRNAs that, to encode an antibody that we would deliver the mRNAs, they'd express it. And these are antibodies that are sperm agglutinating and mucus trapping. Um, so they trap that, um, trap the sperm such that they can't do their job in the female reproductive tract. Okay, let's see. Okay, so just for those not as familiar with immunocontraception, obviously uh, there's been work done for quite some time uh, in this area, mostly out of uh, the fact that about 50%, 15% of couples that um, had unexplained infertility, um, the woman basically had anti-sperm, was making anti-sperm antibodies, and these were essentially the source of infertility. So there were a number of folks that have sequenced these antibodies um, and found that they bind specifically to antigens on the sperm surface. In particular, it's been found that CD52G, uh, which is a small glycoprotein found in quite a bit, a bit of abundance on the sperm surface, um, is the basically is the target of those antibodies in many cases. So uh, one of the antibodies was, sequ was sequenced and found um, and, and the MAP and ZAP bio folks have been working with it. Uh, we encoded it in mRNA, and again, it's against CD52G. We have most of the work I'm going to show you is from IgG, but we're also exploring other uh, other antibodies. So using mRNA to encode IgA and IgM like um, like antibodies. So when I talk about synthetic mRNA, I mean very much uh, a messenger RNA molecule. And this is, uh, again, most of you are probably far more familiar with this now than you were a few years ago, because many of the vaccines that are being used against COVID are mRNA based. But essentially, we make mRNA in a similar fashion to the way the companies do. Um, again, this is truly an mRNA, and it's it's completely synthetic, meaning that we start with a piece of DNA, we in vitro transcribe the RNA off of that, it is capped and tailed, uh, it typically enzymatically in order to produce that mRNA. We don't use any cells in the process of the production of these mRNAs. So they, they do contain a five prime cap, uh, cap one architecture, um, that's helpful for uh, accelerating trends, really for, for having, for producing app dependent translation. There is a five prime UTR. Those regions uh, we've optimized over time in order to enhance translation. Uh, there's an open reading frame. It is codon optimized. Uh, I will admit codon optimization is a little bit different for mRNA than it is for DNA. Uh, you tend to um, essentially increase your GC content quite as much as you can and try to root out any secondary structure in the, in the open reading frame. The three prime UTRs can be varied. We have some that work extremely well. Um, I will say that in general, uh, it can help uh, control uh, translation and um, your durability of translation, but it's, it only controls so much, I guess is the point. Uh, the poly A tail we think is actually quite important. Um, and so we control the tail in order to, uh, again, promote translation and, and durability of the mRNA. And so why use mRNA and what are some important aspects of mRNA? Well, one is very low immunogenicity. So you can imagine if you're going to do any type of gene therapy in the uh, female reproductive tract, you would really want to low immunogenicity. We don't want to recruit new immune cells. We don't want to... Um, and promote inflammation in any way. And so we use modified mRNA that's also purified uh, that exhibits very low immunogenicity. Um, the other issue I think uh, that comes up is this issue of altering your DNA. I think most people who are familiar with mRNA would realize that that's pretty unlikely, but at the same time, it does come up in conversations and, and especially in the, in the world at large. And so um, I just wanna note that it does not alter your DNA. Uh, and there's a very low probability of integration. There has been discussions about um, endogenous retroviral um, um, DNA possibly causing RNA to be converted to DNA. 
um, endogenous reverse transcriptases. I'll be honest, we've never seen any uh, any evidence of that. Um, if, uh, in addition, even if it were converted to DNA, it would have to be integrated for it to have a, a long, really to be very long lasting or created, uh, an episome would have to be created, something like that. And we've not seen anything like it. Honestly, if it did, we'd see expression for much, much longer periods of time, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, we would have noticed that, I think, both in vitro and in vivo. So um, we, I, I'm laughing only because it, it's if it had happened, we probably would have been happy to some degree. <laughs> but I, I, from a safety perspective, though, it's actually probably a good thing that it doesn't happen. So we've just not seen this. And we've done work in, oh, a multitude of species. I mean, most of this work is in macaques. There's work being and sheep and macaques. But we've done other work in, oh, mice, hamsters, ferrets, swine, uh, non-human primates, uh, you name. I mean, a lot of different um, species and never seen this occur. So um, I will admit that for folks who are working with cell lines and especially cancer cell lines or cell lines that have uh, viral origins in terms of their, um, uh, in, terming, be, in terms of being transformed, I think that, that they need to be careful about what they do and what they see and what they observe because there've been some reports that I think are um, a little misleading based on the fact that they were using cells that were not even remotely normal. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, so overall, th this approach is transient. So the synthetic mRNA degrades and it degrades through natural pathways through P-bodies and the RNA exosome. These are two places where RNA go to die. Um, you can redose. Uh, that's not been an issue. Um, we use a very simple formulation that avoids inflammation, that avoids adjuvanting. So that's something to keep in mind too. Um, in the, in the mRNA-based vaccines. And, and I don't mean to make so many cor uh, correlations with the vaccines, but I think it's important for folks to understand the differences between what we're doing and what was given to them in their arm. And so um, in the, in the um, mRNA-based vaccines, they tend to use um, lipid nanoparticles for delivery, and those lipid nanoparticles can be part of the approach that um, essentially yields the inflammation and the signals that are important in producing a vaccine effect. And we don't do that in this case. We're actually using probably the simplest formulation you could think of, which is water and RNA. Um, the other idea is, is persistence. So the other point I want to talk about is persistence. And we've been doing some work on not just engineering the mRNA, but also the protein in order to, um, again, have it persist as much as possible. Um, at the same time, I'll admit when I wrote this slide, when we first thought about persistence, our first goal was just long-term expression of these anti-sperm antibodies. But now I think uh, after being educated a bit about um, the different use cases that are possible. There are certainly short-term use cases that might be very, very helpful to folks. And at the same time, um, we don't have to achieve those super long-term goals. So I just wanna keep that in mind. Um, so when we talk about IgG, typically we're talking about an RNA that expresses the light chain and one RNA that expresses the heavy chain. We have some other designs brewing too that I think are pretty interesting, but just wanna define that. Uh, the anchored, so the uh, the heavy chain, one of the ways that we keep the uh, protein around longer is instead of just having it secreted, instead of just having it secreted, we also add a sequence on the heavy chain that um, causes it to add a GPI anchor uh, in the ER and Golgi as the antibody is being tra um, translated and then processed and moved uh, to this. And, and this allows it to be moved out to the surface of the cell, but it also adds a um, essentially a controlled release mechanism, which I'll talk about later. Um, and the secreted one is clearly just secreted from the cell. And so I want to just bring up some prior work just to give you some context. So um, this is work that was published in 2020 in molecular therapy. This work uh, done specifically by a grad student and grad postdoc in my lab, uh, Kevin Lindsay and uh, Daryl Vanover. Kevin is now in medical school or maybe done. <laughs> but anyway, so... Um, I want to talk a little bit about this approach because it's, again, a little bit odd. So we are essentially applying synthetic mRNA that encode for antibodies against sperm on the cervical and vaginal epithelium. We do this by aerosol. So simply we have RNA and water and we spray it um, on the epithelium and we're working on applicators, which I'll talk about later. Um, this induces, again, mucosal production of an anti-CD52 G antibody. Um, you can measure it in the tissue and in the cervical and vaginal secretions, and it is controllable. And we add this GPI anchor as a way of um, 
uh, essentially controlling the release of that antibody from the cell surface. And so you have the secreted one on the left, you have this GPI anchored one that shows how it's anchored to the membrane. And again, GPI anchors are natural. Uh, we just stole the anchor from uh, decay accelerating factor of that particular gene. And one thing we do do to visualize where the antibody is in tissues, and sometimes even detected in secretions, is we add a, a nanoluciferase to the um, to the light chain. And so it's fairly small. It gets translated along with the light chain. It doesn't seem to impede function at all, but allows us to very easily detect that antibody. So we use that as a tool, sometimes mostly in tissue in order to, to visualize it. So we spray this on the epithelium. So it's just RNA and water. It's sprayed on the epithelium and then the cells take it up and express it. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. I don't mean to reiterate some of the stuff, but for some folks, this is, seems completely foreign <laughs> and crazy. And so the initial experiments we did is we literally compared aerosolizing uh, using this little sprayer called the Teleflex um, to just really just essentially squirting the liquid and RNA in. And what we found is that you really needed the aerosolization. So the impact of the droplets on the epithelium is part of the process by which they actually get into the cell. And, and one thing we found is that it was dose dependent. You can see that in the middle frame. And so um, as we went from 250 to 750 micrograms, and this was all done in sheep. So I should mention that. And then we did notice you did get essentially a dose response as you increased, you get, you get more antibody from it. And what's on the bottom, I think is important for folks to, you know, how did we even ascertain where this is? Um, we actually removed the FRT from sheep and we can visualize the, where the cervix is and the vaginal epithelium. And you can actually see that here. And so this right here is one spray that was on the cervix. And then here you're just seeing sprays against the uh, vaginal epithelium. In real life, we will have a much more sophisticated applicator, a cheap, simple applicator, but one that distributes this a little bit better. But we were really trying to just to ask the question is, is both the vaginal and cervical epithelium, are they permissive to this, to delivery in this manner? And so, um, and clearly they were. And so this is visualized directly from the tissue. So the tissue is removed. We take it to an IVIS. We actually add the substrate to it. Um, and then we can image exactly where it is in the tissue. So I think that these are probably the most these were very striking, uh, even to some of our collaborators, because at first they didn't really believe that this would work. And then when you actually see the expression in the tissue, you realize, yeah, this could definitely happen. And so the next thing we did is we looked at, um, again, expression over time. So this was actually an anti-HIV antibody that we started with. And so in this particular work, but we were able to get to almost 100 micrograms per mil and visualize uh, and basically collect um, samples and it decreases over about a month but it goes down to about 10 micrograms per mil in about 30, 28 days uh, we did a longer study in sheep where we actually looked out to 90 days and what was interesting is that you see it come down but you actually see it come back up again and some of that may have to do with the release and some and recycling of that antibody some folks think that the uh, gpi anchors can be once the uh, antibody is released it can actually rebind to a cell and then be released again and so um, if you look at it on average, you do see this uh, extended durability at times. Um, I think that's, that's also dose dependent. So if we decrease the dose, instead it'll peter out in probably about 20 to, 20 to 30 days without too much difficulty. Um, I just wanna show this. So we did label the RNA with, a, with fluorescent probes, sprayed it on the epithelium and then took a biopsy. Uh, this is from vaginal tissue at about four hours to see where the, um, where the RNA, so we took those biopsies they were then cleared chemically so that their index of refraction was, uh, you could see through the tissue basically. And then we imaged it in the light sheet microscope. And this should hopefully give you an idea. I mean, you do see a lot of the RNA right in the epithelium, but you can see some of it actually penetrates much deeper. And so you do see um, this very deep penetration of the RNA. And I'll show you some images from a, from a, from the macaque uh, cervical, actually the, the um, I think it's the ectocervix and the transition zone that we'll show you to show it's similar to this. This is a sheep um, and I'll show you a little bit. And what you're seeing in white is just the um, autofluorescence. And a lot of that's just the vasculature actually in the tissue. But it gave us a pretty good idea that we were getting RNA was not just getting to these to that initial columnar group of epithelial cells, but actually much deeper than that, which I'm sure is a bit of a surprise. We did in that work want to show that it was functional. And so we took biopsies with different doses and looked to see if it would actually um, inhibit HIV. And I know we're supposed to be talking about contraception, but I just wanted to show kind of where that work was based. Um, we did look at its ability to um, 
um, basically to neutralize um, both uh, clade B and clade C shivs. And this RCO30, the green one is actually control. Uh, it's actually just a heavy chain only. And the heavy chain can bind, which is why you see some effect, but it's certainly not as effective as if you have the whole antibody. So overall, I would say what we were able to show is we could, in a sheep, you know, they were permissive, we could express an antibody and the antibody was functional. So now we're moving towards immunocontraception. So when we first start these projects, the first thing we do is um, we, we uh, again, develop our heavy chain and light chain and we express them. And we even look at the different the, um, stoichiometry between the heavy chain and light chain, which should be about four to one. That's usually about what we use. And that's what we saw. So it was at 80, 20 mixture that you get really um, a whole antibody and you get this very, very nice peak. This is a digital Western, um, definitely fancier than when I ran Westerns uh, back in the day that looked not nearly as nice. And so, and these can be run in like three hours, not in like two days. So I have to admit um, as technology changes, but, but it was very, it, it was really, very easy for the folks in my lab to be able to go see, yeah, how does this really affect it and, and the production of, of just the IgG of the whole molecule. So, so that was good to see. Um, we then, uh, I've been testing in a number of different models. Um, so digital Western blotting, um, immunofluorescence, ELISA, we use their kinetic agglutination assays. So a lot of the functional assays, I should say all of the functional assays are done in Deborah Anderson's lab. Um, just want to make that, make sure that's clear. We do some of the immunofluorescence uh, work ourselves. Some ELISAs are done in my lab, some in Deborah's lab. Um, the macaque work is done uh, in Francois's lab. So it's, we all work together on this. Um, the model systems in vitro, there are a number of different cell types that were used. I have to admit, I don't think any of them are that great, but they're fine to get started with. Um, I guess basically my perspective is nothing beats the animal models in terms of the architecture of the tissue, um, just being as honest as I can be, but we do use these other systems, including a transpel format. Um, uh, cell types. So that's what some of this is just showing um, in these tissue systems in order to simulate what happens. And these are the two species that we've been working in. And so we started out by just expressing the antibody. Um, this is um, in, in A54, we use A549s a lot, but in, our, in my lab, but basically you can see that with an anti-human antibody, uh, secondary, you can easily see this. Uh, you can, the one with analog stains just as well as the one without analog. These are ones that are anchored to the surface. Um, and so hence, that's why you're seeing surface staining. Here, these are, this is the secreted one. And you're seeing this mostly in the ER, which is where you'd expect it because it's on its way out of the cell. And so uh, this is exactly what we'd hope with the nanoluc one, um, nanoluc one stained beautifully for nanoluc. Uh, the other stone is pretty much just background. So you can see clearly that's what we start out with is making sure that we get uh, the type of expression um, then we went on to looking at a number of other cell types. Um, yep. And so the VK2s and A549s and looked at expression of both uh, the secreted antibodies with and without the nanoluc. They secreted well from both. Uh, and A549s, we looked at day one and day seven to see if we could even still see expression, which we did, which was actually a little bit surprising to me, but 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 happy to see in a sense. Um, there's a, a specific ELISA that's done with uh, the antigen uh, that's done by Deborah's lab. And you can see, you know, the, if we compare the, uh, I guess it was at the time MAPS HCA, but I think it's, um, anyway, it's it's the produced antibody that was uh, versus the, uh, the secreted one by mRNA and the secreted one with nanoluc. They all measure very nicely in, a, in the um, antigen specific ELISA. Uh, other tests were done with kinetic, the kinetic agglutination, agglutination assay and the sperm escape assay. Uh, these are important, um, very critical actually, and we'll show you some actually improvements in data. I have to admit that as we get better at expressing this particular antibody, and um, we used a few different expression systems that definitely helped in terms of producing it for these assays, and that did improve them over time, and you'll see that as I move on. But the point in general is that they work well, they do inhibit uh, both uh, sperm pro uh, sperm progression, um, they also work well at again um, slowing them down and agglutinating them. So, so you do see that in both cases, and it's fairly similar to the one that was that's been that was produced uh, commercially. So, we're certainly we're moving in the right direction, and more of they stain sperm well, and so you can see the. Um, 
this is a, a newer, an old school gel for that secreted HCA versus what we got from that bio. And you can see the differences, but, and they worked pretty well. I mean, I would say the secreted one stained sperm as well as the map bio one. So th these were just some of the initial checks we were doing to make sure that we were producing an antibody that actually did what it was supposed to do. Um, we also did this where after, in vitro, just to make sure that if we were expressing them, you know, um, over time that at day one, that the cells, A, were still viable, that was an important issue. And we've never really had trouble with that in the past, but we did it anyway, um, just because our sponsor asked us to. <laughs> and so uh, we looked at, uh, against, uh, did they, what was produced at day one versus day seven, did it still stain the sperm? Did it still agglutinate? So these are the kinds of things that we've been putting together to make sure um, we also made them in mul multiple cell types and um, you get different amounts because the secretory pathways are a little different in these different cells, but it all made antibodies that, that would stain sperm well and agglutinate. So I think overall, we were pretty pleased with that. One question uh, that folks ask me all the time is how does that GPI anchor release the antibody um, into uh, basically into the secretions. And what's nice about GPI anchors is that they're a natural anchor and they do get cleaved naturally. And so they get cleaved by phospholipase C and uh, a little bit by phospholipase D, but I would say they're much more, the one that we're currently using is much more susceptible to uh, phospholipase C cleavage. And so that's made by most epithelial cells. And so you can see when we do this test where um, you have both, uh, again, we're looking at the, at the uh, about the, the antibody here. This is um, with permeabilization, so you can see everything. And then this is without it, so you're only seeing the surface. But as you add PLC, what happens? It removes the antibody. <laughs> and so this was a nice test, and it does it in a semi-dose dependent fashion. But you can, and, and you can see that what we're getting off of it is, is still, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's full of full antibody. And so we just verified that, that, and uh, what we were actually getting, but this is, this is, it was nice to see. And we did another, so, so in this uh, particular experiment, we were just changing. And then we actually changed very, very low units to see what happens over time. And again, you can see now the dose dependent fashion. At first we were using a bit, a bit more than we realized. And so even small amounts of it, you can see it, uh, remove the, remove it from the, from the cell surface. So that was nice to see. That's what it should do. Um, but again, uh, a lot of this hadn't been tested before. And I have to admit, we were even using that anchor before we actually had looked at this in great detail. And so this was just uh, reaffirming to folks what the mechanism is. Um, so another question is, could we actually increase expression by co-expressing proteins associated with the secretory machinery? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, we did a number of different studies where we looked at um, a whole host of secretory factors. So um, the uh, four that are involved in um, exocytic vesicle trafficking, some in e ER translocation, uh, signal peptide recognition, and, and other transcription factors that are associated with, uh, with secretion. And you're probably wondering, well, why are we doing this? And part of the reason, where do these come from? And most of these factors come from uh, transcriptomic work that was, that's was that been done on plasma cells. And so um, clearly we are having epithelial cells that don't normally make um, antibodies, make antibodies. And so you can imagine that they may need a little help because plasma cells are um, evolutionarily um, optimized to, to produce and secrete antibodies and these cells are not. And so, Let's see if I can get to the next slide. So we actually looked at a bunch of these and, and I would say overall, it was pretty impressive. I mean, you know, over the HCA alone, I mean, you can see fairly large, you know, increases in the amount of antibody that's being made. And there are different combinations and different factors that seem to have uh, that all boosted some. So I guess overall, I mean, it, it can be very, very helpful. Uh, in terms of, and if it's secreted versus, it seems to, I think, give a bigger effect when they're secreted versus anchored, but just the same, um, they can improve things. So this is something that we're starting to look at in vivo to see if, and so you're probably wondering, how would you do this? So you'd have your mRNA that encode the antibody, and then you would add an, uh, an mRNA, excuse me, an mRNA that encodes for some of these factors. And because we're delivering with water uh, on the epithelium, it's really not a problem for us to add lots of different RNAs. And so from that perspective, um, we're not limited by how many we can load into an LNP or polymer or some other vehicle. And so it actually gives us a lot of flexibility. And so we went ahead and did uh, a few, a few uh, short studies in macaques just to see if we were getting expression. 
Um, one thing I'll, I'll note is that uh, since this ex since this experiment, we've basically increased the dose sum. Um, we have found that the the um, they're not quite as permissive as what we've seen in the sheep, which is fine. Uh, there are animal differences. I mean, they're not way off. It's like you know, a hundred versus forty or so. So they weren't way off, but it was certainly. And the sheep is very similar in many respects. The biggest difference is that we probably need to dose up from this experiment a little bit, but, but just the same, we were able to make in the first day about 40 micrograms per mil, and then it came down over about a week. And then you do see some blips, which is similar to what we saw um, in the sheep experiments. I think one thing that's different is that, um, again, we weren't making as much. So our, our milestone was to get above 10 micrograms per mil, and we were able to do that for about a week a week's time. And I think for short term use, short term use, this actually might be very helpful. So at on demand, um, we do make this antibody in hours. So um, we sampled it one day, but it does it is produced rather quickly, which is something that's very different from other approaches. Um, from DNA or even viral based approaches, usually it takes some time before they kick in, but this gets made in hours, but we, we sampled it one day. Some previous work showed that it definitely gets made uh, a bit sooner. Um, we know we're making the antibody here. We can see that um, in our digital Western. So, so that was all good. We also stained sperm too. And so um, this was from a couple of different animals. So this is from one macaque where we just sampled at day one and we could clearly see that we could stain sperm with it. This was from day seven. We could clearly see that we compared that to the commer commercially produced antibody. So overall, we were pretty happy with that. So uh, the ELISA was working. We were seeing amounts that made sense and uh, they were clearly, stir, uh, you know, we were able to, to, to bind to sperm. One thing we wanted to do though, is that we know that IgG by itself definitely has some limitations in terms of how well it agglutinates. I mean, it's not really the, probably your best choice. And so, and I have to admit to date, really most of the work on mRNA expressed antibodies has been focused on liver expression of IgG. Um, I, I call my group a bit rebellious because we we look at other parts of the body to make IgG. Um, and so uh, the, the Nature Com paper was in the lung um, and then um, the molecular therapy paper was uh, intravaginal delivery. And these two last uh, papers, one that just came out literally yesterday are for lung work. And so all of these involve antibody expression from mRNA, but um, a lot of it is on local delivery. And then one thing we noticed is that there was, there's been some work from Sam Lai's group on, on other antibody forms that may be better. And so there's a whole, he published, a, his group published work in science translational medicine last year on these really interesting multifab compounds. Um, we've been making these two up at the top. And then, um, but more recently, we started thinking about dimeric IgA and some multimeric uh, IgGs. And we wanted to see, could we make these? And the answer was, yeah, we can. <laughs> and so, so we encoded these in mRNA. And the first thing we did was see, you know, could they even stain sperm? And actually, I would say that, you know, the IgM-like ones and the IG, IgA, sorry for the color change, um, but just the same, they both uh, stain sperm extremely well. So that was, that was really exciting to see. Um, wasn't clear that this would happen. <laughs> and so, um, but in addition, I think the place, this was work um, done in Deborah's lab where she was looking at um, sperm motility. And this was the one where I think it really opened my eyes a bit. I mean, both the IgM and the IgA or AgM like molecules really kill progressive sperm motion. I mean, it was the part that I think was the most interesting one to me was to see how tight the distributions were and, and how much it was helpful. I, I mean, the time to glutination was still pretty fast, I would say. I think they used 150 seconds as their cutoff and were, you know, way below that. But and this was with 25 micrograms per mil. But but just the same, we could see this to me was really exciting about, hey, if we want to improve it, this is one way that we can do that. The other assays that uh, were done in uh, Deborah's lab, I think that were really exciting was also looking at, again, these number of progressive sperm, but in cervical mucus, this was in human cervical mucus. And so what you could see is that, again, the controls don't do such a good job, which is great. <laughs> and so what, but what you see is really within 30 minutes or even 60 minutes, it's, they're very, very effective. And I think um, these other antibody forms, uh, both IgGA1 and 2 and the IgM-like molecules are you, you, you don't even see a blip compared to say the IgG. So I think, you know, we're thinking this is probably the way to go in the future. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, Sam showed in his work that, you know, you really need other structures work far better than 
then um, then I would say IgG is not that there's anything wrong with IgG, but I think you know it makes sense at the mucosa to use uh, antibody structures that are probably a bit more effective. And, and this was at 90 minutes and still you know really doing a good job. And so I think that there's there's certainly a lot of work to do, and this is a new area, but I think it gives us. Uh, a lot of uh, hope that we're going to have a different approach. And just in general, I wanted to mention um, as a last note is that um, we are looking at delivery of mRNA to other parts of the, of the female reproductive tracts. We're actually doing some work on, the, uh, on males also uh, in, in different animal models. And so I think that uh, we don't have to express just antibodies. <laughs> I just want to mention that too. We express lots of other types of molecules for other types of work. So I don't think this is the only way that this can be applied uh, to um, basically to contraception or possible or to female reproductive health. So I think it's really just the beginning. In many ways, I feel like being able, the fact that the cervical epithelium and the vaginal epithelium are permissive to delivery gives us actually far more options, to be honest. I, I think the antibody is kind of the, the first step actually, just because we understand antibodies pretty well as molecules, but I think there's much more complex things that could be done uh, moving forward. Um, to me, once you can deliver mRNA to a part of the body, um, it only opens, it opens this door to a lot of different applications to different pathologies. And so um, really it's just the beginning. So anyway, um, the other thing I was going to mention, oh yeah, I forgot I had these tissue pictures, sorry. <laughs> and so this is in a macaque. We applied it to uh, the cervix and the macaque. You can see the luminescence. And then we stained for where that antibody is. And you can see where it is in the tissue. Again, not just hitting the epithelium. You're seeing it deeper, pretty similar to what we saw in the sheep. Uh, I'll admit that we did use a higher dose than in some of those earlier macaque studies. And I think that was something we needed to do. Um, we also stained for an ectocervix marker, and you can see that um, it's it's exa exactly where you expect. It's certainly hitting other cell types too, but in general, it's where we expected it to be. So I just wanted to mention that too. And then last thing, we, we've looked at applicators some. Um, clearly, this is a limitation of the work. We need to make sure we understand how to develop them. We looked at antifungal and tampons as kind of size, shape um, applicators for us to look at. And we're starting to design one um, that I think in the future would be, uh, and these would be throw away, they could be used and then thrown away. Uh, the RNA can all be lyophilized, so it could be stored just about anywhere. Um, very easily to make one of these, it mixes with the water as you're spraying it. So I think we can come up with something that, that works well. That size is probably a little big. We're trying to make it actually much thinner, but that's um, in the future, I think that's, that's where we're trying to go. And I want to acknowledge uh, NICHD and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for, uh, for funding some of this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Santangelo. Um, we are for a wonderful talk. We are now open for questions. And we have here one uh, question, great talk. Have you tried expressing the antibodies from a viral or non-viral vector to induce permanent sterility via via via, uh, via the express antibodies? Uh, no, uh, we haven't tried anything that's for permanent sterility at all. So um, that's, I mean, um, I don't, I don't think that's that's on our our plate. We're looking for mostly reversible immunocontraception in general. So I think what what, what I've learned through a lot of the um, interactions with some of the social scientists in the field, which I have to admit was facilitated greatly by NICHD, since I, that's a little out of my world, um, was that there are really a lot of use cases. And so I think that, you know, where we should be going with this is trying to control for, you know, something long, I don't know, certainly not permanent st sterility, but certainly some longer lasting, but there's lots of short-term use cases, you know, that um, I think that the goal of this is to be able to come up with more than a few, um, as you can probably imagine, we've also expressed antibodies against HIV. Uh, we're looking at now how to combine those two, uh, certainly writing grants in that direction, to be honest, to try and combine the two, uh, which I think we can. Um, and so, and against HSV2 and other relevant pathogens. So I, I guess from my perspective, I'd rather try and, um, you know, how can we combine these uh, and, and then really have suites of products, so to speak. Uh, I know we're academics, but thinking these as products so that, but that would have different use cases. And so that, um, you know, we can, so that there's that choice in terms of how you 
how women actually use the products um, that fit their lifestyle. I have to admit, I live a pretty boring life. So in many respects, I didn't think of all the ways that, that this could be used. And so um, I was uh, educated on that subject. And so now I'm, I'm actually kind of excited because I think there's lots of what we can do. We didn't want to go, you know, the viral route, I guess, from our perspective, just because, I mean, AAV, you get plenty of antibody, but you, you'd have it for a long time. And, and I guess the other issue is you'd only be able to deliver that once, very likely, just because of immunogenicity um, to the vector itself. Um, so I, and I don't know if you'd get antibodies against the antibody or not because you're using a viral vector. So I think there's, there's, we're trying to keep this approach as keep the immunogenicity as low as absolutely possible. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. We have another question here. Excellent talk and very interesting results. Do you think your mRNA vaginal delivery technology will work with the expression of spermicidal antimicrobial peptides? which would kill both sperm and microbes? So I think that's a great idea, actually. Um, a matter of fact, we've looked at LL37 some, and so, um, uh, and cathocidin. So I, I actually haven't applied it in this world, but have certainly thought about it. And so uh, no question, there are also a number of other um, antimicrobial peptides from other species that might be interesting too, because they wouldn't hang around that long, but it could be helpful, especially for an on demand. I think the only thing about peptides so I think for like for short term, that actually might be fantastic um, or, you know, right afterwards, some, you know, uh, I think that's another place, uh, place where that could be used. Um, so it's something to think about. I, I think it's a good question, actually. Um, we've also been looking at how can you take a peptide and give it a longer half-life? So we might be able to use that in conjunction with a fuse to other molecules that have longer half-lives. We've been doing that with some other peptide work because sometimes they just don't hang around for very long, I would say, overall. But I think it's a good idea, and I think it, it would need more work, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Okay, is there an advantage to having deep penetration of the mRNA rather than just reside on surface for binding a sperm? I, I think it does because a lot of those antibodies will get, so even if they're made by cells that are deeper in the tissue, they'll get trafficked to the surface because there is evidence that there are B cells that are actually deeper in that tissue that will produce antibodies at times for, and those antibodies do get trafficked. So I think there's actually, uh, again, kind of part of the uh, controlled release. Sometimes I think that's, I think I say, um, that some of the longer term expression that we see is actually from those cells that are deeper, but we need to do more work on the tissue and expression in the tissue in order to understand that better, I'll admit that. But I think that that's where some of it's coming from and there are mechanisms for, for trafficking, if that makes sense. I actually have a question related to that. How deep, uh, does your, the penetration uh, depend on the strength of the spray? So I don't think, I, maybe, maybe, I, I, I can't say we know that directly. We've used some sprayers when we first started that were not as, um, the velocities were lower than the current ones, but we still saw a transfection, but I have to admit we haven't compared them as much as maybe one would like. The older sprayer were actually ones that are no longer available. We have some in the lab, but they're not uh, they're sort of precious, to be honest. Nobody wants to break them. But the Teleflex, which we use all the time, is commercially available. It's an FDA. It's an FDA approved for um, for certain human applications, and so we've stuck with that one because it's easier to use. But I'll admit that you know, looking at the spray dynamics and how that affects delivery is something we will we'll need to do. Um, as we move in product development, I have to admit we've concentrated more on the mRNA slash antibody side of it, but eventually we're going to have to move back and look at the applicator spray part to put that product together. So I'll admit that um, we can't, I guess we don't have the bandwidth to focus on all of that all at once. And so we've been focusing on more on the molecular biology, that side of it, but you're right. Eventually there are, there are some of those uh, characteristics that need to be looked at. Mm -hmm. And to make it easy for women to use too. But I think if we make it thin enough, it, I think we can do that. It'll take work though. I mean, I'm, just like anything else. And nothing's perfect. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, this is the only way you can do any of this, or this is the, um, we just, it, it, what was, I think that one thing that was attractive was the simplicity of the formulation. 
You know, it's RNA in water. You know, FDA is not going to have any problems with that. They just, you know, they just approved the application of RNA and billions of people in an LNP with lots of components. <laughs> it's stuck in your arm. So I, I'm pretty confident that uh, we should be in good shape from that perspective. So we're trying to take advantage of that. That means the applicator may need to be a little more, I don't say complex, but I don't know. I think that's a, it's, it's an interesting trade-off. Um, but there are other, you know, other ways that we might be able to deliver this with RNA too. So here, there's um, one person that have three questions. Can you expand on the potential for mRNA delivery in the mail? What tissues and delivery mechanisms? Yeah, um, we just started doing some of that, and it's been mostly in. Um, crazy enough in bulls. So um, that's the model that we've been using. But, um, and the reason for that is that one of my collaborators is, is interested in uh, trichomonas. Uh, when I see, I'm uh, trying to think of which one. It's one of the, tr it's one of the fetus. trick pathogens fetus. that's in a cow. Fetus, that's correct. T fetus, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, sorry, I should know this off the top of my head. I still have a little jet lag, but just the same. Thank you. Um, but it is T fetus. And so she was interested in that. She had some antibodies, and so we've been actually applying it to um, to the um, uh, basically the epithelium of the bull's penis, and uh, I think we're seeing some interesting results. So there's more work to be done there, but it was um, uh, I would say that overall, it's I think it has possibilities, and so I guess what I thought, hey, if that works, then. Uh, let's see what, you know, that certainly opens the door for use in people. There are obviously some anatomical differences, but I would say in general, I don't think, um, I think, the, I don't think they would actually preclude its use. I think actually it might be easier in humans than it was in the bulls, which I won't get into the details of um, uh, just because uh, it makes some people squeamish a little bit, <laughs> but just the same, um, the, anat the anatomy is such that I think that there are differences, but at the same time, I think uh, it has good possibility. So yeah, I mean, there's there's more to be done there. We've been using that model as a as a basis just to see, you know, where where what's permissive, what's not, what part of the anatomy is, uh, and then how much we're looking at how much antibody we can make. And so I think that um, uh, and again, uh, trick is an interesting pathogen. Period. Important uh, in the human population. Again, it's this different, slightly different pathogen, but it's in the um, different parasite, but it's in the ballpark. So I think uh, we're learning from that, from that work, and hopefully we'll be able to apply it in people. But um, I, I'm not going to talk too much more about it because there's still more work to be done, but it certainly was surprising that I think it has, I think it has uh, potential. And so if, if we get to the, a certain point in that, hopefully I'll give another talk on how we can use this in males. So. Can you talk more about the mechanism of transfection? Why would an epithelial cell take up and express an exogenous mRNA with no delivery vehicle? Uh, it seems like a viral vulnerability. Yeah, it, 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 it certainly does. I think it has a lot to do with actually how the droplets interact with the epithelium. I also think it has a little bit to do with the fact that it's water. We don't add any salt. And so I think that uh, there's both a, uh, an osmotic mechanism. Um, there are lots of uh, papers that talk about how hypo uh, uh, basically um, low salt environments are important for drug delivery. Uh, people have shown that before in the vaginal epithelium and cervical epithelium. So by removing the salt, uh, we also remove secondary structure completely from the mRNA. And so I, I think overall, um, I will say we have looked for endocytosis and endocytic um, pathways, and we don't really, I mean, honestly, most of it gets in really as fast as we can observe it, and it's cytosolic. So I'll admit, um, maybe it is a problem, but I don't think, um, I don't think, I think it's a combination of that, how the droplets are interacting and the fact that it's water, and you don't get that with viral, you know, with viruses. So in excuse me, endogenous pathogens that are able to really utilize that route. So maybe it is a hole in our, you know, in, in, in the way cells take up, but I think we're, we're going to die. We're taking advantage of it for delivery, but I'll admit, we still need to understand more. The hardest thing is that, you know, I mean, we do, uh, we use a number of different techniques, RNA scope for, in, for in situ hybridization to look to see where the RNA is. Uh, we use a number, we can label the RNA, but uh, in the tissue itself, uh, we're still digging in terms of you know, the exact mechanism. I, I think most, probably the best place for us to do those mechanistic studies are in the ALI cultures, air liquid interface type cultures, but, but even they're not perfect either. So I, I'll admit that either of them, there's still more work to be done on mechanism, but I can tell you it's not what we expected at all. So. Okay, 
uh, how are we with time, uh, Rafael? We have to, because we have more questions here. I think we have another five to five five more minutes. Okay, I'm going to go to another um, to a question from another attendee. So, do species pH differences play a role in the stability expression? Um, I would say overall, we haven't seen a big difference in, in pH. I mean, I should say pH is different from species to species. We haven't seen a big difference in expression. That may have some, but it may have some role, definitely. And that's partially why we, we, we were also thinking about going away from IgG, because IgG um, is, is not as stable in the mucosa. And, and so you certainly see that across species. That's why I, you know, that's why we were thinking about IgA in particular and IgM, just because they tend to, especially IgA is certainly more stable. And so, um, and we had a number of people bring that up to us so that, we're, you know, we were doing it anyway, we just hadn't done it. But now I think it's certainly one that we're interested in, in pursuing. Okay, we have another talk, uh, two questions here that are very similar. Great talk and presentation in future use for humans. How often do you think this mRNA antibody will be needed to be applied for effective action? How good is the reversal rate? Yeah, so I think that, you know, I think there's one product that could literally be like a, a week long. So it would be gone after four or five days, let's just say, um, which I think, you know, for a long weekend or that type of, again, short term use. Um, and then you could reapply it then if you wanted to. And so I think that's one particular, and I think there's another that would be more like a once a month. And I think those are the two that we're looking at now. Uh, much longer than that would probably need some kind of controlled release mechanism, but I, 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 you know, a much a different controlled release mechanism, I should say. But I think once a month or like once a week kind of thing is kind of what we're looking at. The once a week was not something we would expect someone to use every single week, could, but at the same time, it was more of a, you know, you you think you might need it, you go ahead and, you know, and use it so that you're prepared. And I think in combination with anti-HIV, anti-HSV2, anti-parasite, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'd like this to go. Very interesting talk. Uh, can uh, hijacking the epithelium imaginary to produce these antibodies affect its health or production of other proteins in any other way? So in general, the biggest things I think that we were concerned about was ER stress. Uh, you know, would you produce ER stress in those cells? Yeah, and then global translational shutdown. We haven't seen that. I don't think we've produced enough to, to induce that. Um, when you talk about, uh, you know, the, when we look at, um, you know, transcriptome of cells, we don't really see big changes when they're making antibodies. So I don't think that's a big issue overall. Um, I think uh, you probably could overwhelm the system maybe with a, you know, like a viral based approach, but I think with the MRNA based approach, we, we, we haven't gotten to the point where we've overwhelmed the system and then caused problems in those cells. And I come back to a previous question. If the expression sure. is transient only a few days, what is the advantage of the MRNA based uh, approach over just direct mucosal application of a synthetically produced antibody? Sure. So what I've seen so far, at least with the direct approach, is that they last about a day. And so I would say we're lasting really more like five, six, you know, I'd say a week is probably the, the time frame that we're that we're gearing towards. So one application, one week. Um, and so that's kind of the direction that we're, we're looking at. Most of the uh, directly applied approaches I see about would probably have to be used every day, to be honest. So I guess I guess that's what I would say is the approach. And I think someone asked about how would be how would it be applied? And again, essentially, it is different. You would have to basically um, insert the device and then spray. So really, it would be insert and hit the plunger, and that's it. So kind of similar to some of the. Um, you know, would be maybe a little bit different than the application of a tampon, probably more like the, um, the, um, um, some of the other, uh, applicators that have been used in the past, but literally would be take it out, insert, plunge, done. And it would take literally seconds, pull it out, throw it away, gone. And there really wouldn't be any evidence of it at that point. And Celia, one more question, if you want, that's the last question. Sure. Yeah. There's, there are two more questions. Should I do both or? Yes, and that's it. Okay. I'll try to go fast. <laughs> so do these antibodies have to be delivered intravaginally? What would be an alternative method for the drug delivery other than vaginal? And there, what are the challenges about the final formulation? Yeah, I think that that's, that's where the challenge is. I mean, there's other ways to, uh, I think that we could. 
So I'll put it this way. There are other folks who have tried systemic delivery, but the problem with systemic delivery, it's, it's, it's systemic. I mean, first of all, I am nobody really liked for a vaccine. I don't think they're going to want to use for this. Plus, even the antibodies that are in circulation, their penetration into the FRT is not great. I mean, they've seen that before with anti-HIV antibodies. So you give high levels of BNABs, they don't really make it uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. They don't really make it um, particularly that efficiently into the vaginal vault. So I guess I would say overall, um, I think local is better. Now, how we're doing local could certainly be changed. I'm not against trying some rings. I think we could incorporate there. And again, the mechanism, you probably have to include something for delivery, but I think there's other ways, um, gels, um, you know, there are other, there are other possibilities, but in the end, I think we've gone back to this, at least for now. Um, just because it's simple and there's no mess gels. Some people don't like at all. And I guess it comes down to, you know, some people don't like insertion so that I could understand that. Like that's definitely a negative for some, fo for, for some people. So I'll admit the way we're envisioning this now will not work for everyone. But I think, um, I think there are some people who would take advantage of, of using it. Um, but I think there are other ways we need to be creative about control release. Um, patches might be doable, but again, I always worried about, I always worry about whether the antibody would make it, how much of it's really going to make it to where it needs to be functional. Um, I think there are some other under the skin approaches that could be used, uh, in the, you know, in, um, nearby. And so I think there are other ways to release it, um, but it's something that's going to take a little bit more. I have to admit more work actually than even, <laughs> I think it would be harder though, probably doable um, than the approaches. I think the approach we're, we're trying to go with is the quick, simple, you know, kind of keeping it as simple as possible. And no, it may not last forever, but at the same time, if it lasts, if it covers us two use cases, I was talking about once a week, once a month, I think that's still a good start. I mean, even if we show that initially, um, since there are no mRNA products for uh, contraception, that might be a, a simple way and then go to more complex formulations and look, you know, because you're going to have to look at safety there too. So I, ho I hope that helps a bit. Okay, last question. I think I have yeah. keep coming, but how about the effect on front runner sperm that already traveled to the uterus and fallopian tube? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Maybe I missed, I didn't see that. How one about the effect on front runner sperm okay. that already traveled to the uterus and the fallopian tube? Uh, I guess that is a good question. I mean, um, I guess I'm hoping that. Um, you know, this is going to be used early enough that there's enough there to capture it. I mean, I, I, I so I guess that would be my perspective. I don't think, I mean, um, I, I have to admit the way we're envisioning this now post uh, exposure probably isn't going to be great. So I'll admit that that's not really the time. It's really a prophylactic type, but hopefully not too, again, a few hours, not, not, days or years or weeks or, you know, you could use it pretty, pretty early on. So um, you need to give it a few hours, but I think if you can wait that long, I think that's, that's how this approach would be used. Great. Um, so I think this is the end of today's session. I really want to thank the speakers and Celia for coordinating an absolutely awesome session. I also want to uh, remind everyone that we have a follow-up a mini symposium next Tuesday, but a different time. And finally, all of this information is the talks were recorded and will be available uh, from those who registered. So if you want to see this again or have some colleagues see it, please uh, share the, the information. Again, thank you. And I see you next Tuesday.